please join me in welcoming Josh Corman uh, to give a talk about how we cross the river together. All right, now if I can only get this to work again. Um, hi. So, uh, morning, I'm feeling a lot of feels today. So, uh, I'm not even sure where we're gonna go with this, but we'll find out. Um, I can promise you this, it'll be authentic. Um, so, I probably should explain the title, and together we cross the river, but I'm probably gonna postpone that a little bit. Um, so, it was uh, August 1st, 10 years ago, after being rejected from DEF CON, uh, Nick and I offered a talk titled, The Cavalry Isn't Coming, and it was a conversation. It happened in this room, configured a little differently. And uh, Banshee and Jack and Damon moved heaven and earth to make sure that this important discussion happened. And, uh, and after some circulation of how the hell did this not get picked, uh, Dark Tangent gave us uh, the keynote stage Sunday morning, a couple days later uh, at DEF CON, and I think we're still one of the top 10 talks of DEF CON. Um, not because it was a flashy O day, but because it really tapped into purpose and a North Star and how uh, important what we do could be to our families, our, our societies, et cetera. So I'm not gonna, uh, there were, in the build up to this, I had several competing theories. One was, I wonder if I could give the exact same talk and how it would hit a decade later. So I want you to think back to 2013, I'm not gonna do that. Um, <laughs> I want you to think back to 2013, okay? I don't know where you were living, I don't know where you were working, I don't know what car you were driving, like, I don't know what evokes your memory there, but people were pretty pissed off. There was a trend towards increased criminalization of research. Hacker was a dirty word. Uh, Snowden kind of shattered trust kind of amongst the community, amongst govies. Uh, President Obama said, I'm not gonna scramble some jets for some hacker. Um, there was a lot of concern and existential dread amongst the hacker community that year. Um, I felt moved to do this for some very personal reasons, and when I went and watched the video yesterday, um, some parts hit me pretty hard, and things I remember saying in that room, I never actually said in that room, so I might add some color and context today, but, uh, and that will help make sense for why the talk is titled this. Um, but what I did say in the room is that uh, our dependence on connected technology was growing much faster than our ability to secure it in areas affecting public safety and human life. Uh, and after doing a whole lot of looking high and low in the government and for the adults, there weren't any. And it was incredibly demoralizing to see that the cavalry isn't coming to save us. After researching Anonymous for a couple of years with Jericho and being concerned about the rise of personal power curve of the individual, in a hyper-connected world, the corollary to that is, all right, if they're powerful, so are we. And if no one's coming to save you, it's also empowering, because then you know it falls to you, to you or nobody. So you don't feel helpless, you make a choice. Am I gonna fight or not? So the call to action was, what are you willing and able to do? Can we be that voice of reason, that technically literate, uh, honest broker? Can we be a helping hand instead of a pointing finger? Can we, can we transcend the rock star culture and the glory and ego culture and instead try to solve real problems? And instead of bringing a pointing finger and, and anger, can we bring empathy and a helping hand? Instead of taking a tactical view of finding and fixing a single flaw and a single medical device from a single manufacturer in a big uh, contested public debate, um, could we hack the incentives so that all medical devices were safer? And we had no idea if any of this would work. I, I think I was at my feeling my most powerless and shattered when we made the call. 
um, and a decade later, boy, does the world look different. So I don't know your personal touch point for 10 years ago, but to, to bounce between then and now quite a few times, hackers are cherished in public policy circles. We have government officials here today. We have a DEF CON policy track. We have a black hat policy track. We have hackers on the Hill. We have hackers in the White House. Hackers helped write the White House National Cybersecurity Strategy. Hackers have passed federal laws. Hackers have passed UK laws. Hackers have influenced transparency regimes across the globe. We went from a full disclosure mantra now to every federal agency has to have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program. Now that was not an easy journey from 10 years ago where hackers were increasingly criminalized to having good faith research carve outs for DMCA and CFAA and being invited to White House meetings and testifying to Congress. And I have no idea how we did it. I mean, we can give you data points, you can come to our track today and tomorrow and you can hear some of the success stories and some of the blueprints. But Bo Woods and I joked that if we ever wrote a book, it would be called, we have no idea what we're doing, but it seems to be working. But I think when we reflect on what worked and what didn't, um, something like this, something as transformative as this could not have happened outside of the B-Sides family. Hackers are not a single tribe. We're a tribe of tribes and sometimes warring factions. But this is the community that thinks of their place in the world, that wants to mentor others, that wants to give people their first speaking. I mean, the very birth of B-Sides was that first time speakers could never break into the cabal of the gatekeeping of the Black Hat Conference. We were hearing the same things over and over from the same rock stars. Yes, they're accomplished. Yes, they're amazing. How do you get new blood and new talent? And it's very hard to break through. So one of the spirits of B-Sides was to um, democratize that power instead of hoarding that power. To inform, inspire, and influence, and help, and shape, and cultivate. And only this community could have given us that refuge to ask this crazy thing 10 years ago. All right, I've been rambling. This journey for me did not start with this talk. Some of you know this, I'm gonna give a little bit of it, not all of it, a little bit of it. So there's a lot of fields in here for a lot of different reasons. I had researched the rise of anonymous and hacktivism. I was concerned that this was a significant moment, that it was going to, it was the front line of what happens when large groups of post-national use opt out of social contracts and take direct action online. It's an emergent property of the internet. I felt that it could erode social contracts because I'm a philosopher, hacker, systems thinker, idiot, altruist who spent way too long in the hacker community, but I was worried that it may inspire things like cyber terrorism, and it did. Uh, a Team Poison member from UK named uh, Junaid Hussein, a, a Pakistani UK honor student from Birmingham joined Team Poison, hacked Tony Blair's website, got arrested, went to jail, and in jail was radicalized. And when he got out, he moved his Anglo-Saxon punk rock wife and child to Raqqa, Syria, where he founded the Cyber Caliphate, and uh, was recruiting and inspiring physical attacks in the US and abroad and hiring hackers. And I was terrified at the concept of what could someone willing and able to take human life do with Shodan and script kitty tools, and the answer is a lot. So I kept these to myself, and I tried to find the adults in the room, and I tried to whisper to people in government and the intelligence community and allies, and eventually, I'm gonna skip ahead for what happened with him, but they eventually put him on the US kill list, and I think he was number four, the most dangerous person for our interests, and he was eventually killed by drone strike uh, in Raqqa. But I was worried in a world of seven billion people, it doesn't matter what most of them would do, it matters what one of them could do. 
and it was way too easy to reach out and touch someone. So after successfully spotting false flags and predicting movements, um, the intelligence community said, how are you doing this? And we showed them how, and I got invited into Fort Meade for two days, and I got to pick five hackers. And I figured each one of them are really strong. Maybe we can form the team of Avengers. Maybe we can see what we could do. And the goal was to help General Alexander figure out his attitude on different legislative proposals for cyber. There was no cybersecurity framework at the time. There was no Snowden yet. In fact, this never would have happened had it happened in the wrong order. But we brought um, Kaminsky and uh, HD, Alex Hutton, Gene Kim, um, David Etchu, and we answered some really, really important and hard questions. Like if you could add one sentence of legislation to have the most material impact on public safety, human life, and US critical infrastructure, and the hemorrhage of intellectual property from the uh, US economy to China, what would that one sentence be? And it was amazing to see their powers combined. Um, part of the feels is, you know, as somebody who's been gate kept and never felt like I had something to contribute, here I am talking truth to power to some of the most important people in the world and trying to put on their agenda that we're worried that we could have mass casualties and loss of life in our food supply and our hospitals and our power grids. And I'm watching these people that are strong alone be so much stronger together and that's all great. But what, what else was going on in my life is my mother had had a stroke and uh, we knew she'd have some speech pattern things to fix, but in between day one and two of the most memorable moment of my life, what I thought was gonna be the pinnacle of my impact on the planet, if you wanna dent the universe, I go to my car, uh, grab my cell phone, and I had 18 voicemails saying, I'm so sorry, Josh, I'm so sorry, Josh, I'm so sorry, Josh. <sighs> And uh, finally, when I got to my sisters, I'm like, finally figured out what they were talking about. But it basically, it wasn't just a stroke. It was pretty aggressive, aggressive brain cancer. So we knew that we'd be um, ending her life soon. So I sucked it up, went and taught a class, went back, didn't tell my friends, tried to do day two. And we came up with breathtaking ideas. And we answered all the challenge questions. And at the end of it, when we did our readout, uh, the answers were, we can't do that one. There's no statutory authority for that one. People would have to die first for us to try that one. You're absolutely right about this one, but good luck getting that through Congress. And basically, at the end of the readout, we couldn't do a single one of our transformative ideas, not even one. So it was both magical and demoralizing. And that was at the airport bar when none of us spoke for probably 30 minutes that I broke the silence and I said half of the answer here. I said, the cavalry isn't coming. And we all got on our airplanes and we all flew home. Now, meanwhile, I didn't have the answer to the other half, but we start hospicing my mom, 58 years old, trying to watch her die with dignity. It came a point where we had to take her away from her home to my sister's house more closely, uh, close by. And all she wanted to do as a superintendent of a school district and a very active member of her church is say goodbye to her friends one last time. And uh, it shit luck, it happened to be the Sandy Hook shooting weekend. So she didn't even get to say goodbye to her friends because everybody was shell-shocked. All the teachers she was responsible for, all the students, everyone's afraid. So for hours in that church, we just heard her preachers say, why is there evil in the world? Why is there evil in the world? And I just remember being angry and hurt. And I'm watching my little girls afraid to go to school. I'm watching my little girls hug their grandmother who's dying. And it was, you know, one of the most gutting at bottom moments of my life. And then we fast forward and we're hospicing her for a little bit longer. She dies in January. I have to go back to that church. I have to walk back into the place where I last felt angry. Thank you, Jack. (laughs) 
I have to walk back into that place where I felt angry. And I don't like to be angry. I want to be constructive. So I had to metabolize that. And somewhere between walking in the front door and getting to the stage to give the eulogy, because I was her oldest, I, uh, I realized, OK, my mom got to be my seventh grade science teacher. She was a phenomenal teacher. Somebody got hurt, shouldn't have been allowed. They made me, had to make an exception. And of the many things she taught me, darkness isn't a thing. It's an absence of light. Cold is not a thing. It's an absence of heat. So maybe it's not the presence of evil, but the absence of good. And maybe that's why I was so angry the last time I was there. Um, so I asked her family, her friends, her parents, her siblings, her grandkids, what is the absence of Marie? And I didn't have an answer. I just looked at them and I said, we don't get to find out, because it falls to us to do what she was doing. Now, to get to something hacker related, um, I finished the sentence in my head. I said, if the cavalry isn't coming, if something's missing, it falls to us to put it there. So I didn't know if it would work. I didn't know if anybody would say yes. Didn't know if we'd have a single accomplishment. But I knew it was worth trying. OK. So the song, <clears throat> um, I was shattered. Um, I was given the keynote at B-Side San Francisco and I had nothing in the tank. Um, and Jack, my brother, who just gave me a hug, uh, he had to scoot me off the emotional floor and take me to wine country at the end of this RSA week. I couldn't even speak. We just played music. Couldn't speak. I didn't know if I'd stay in security. I didn't know if I had any energy left. And that Pussifer song came on. The humbling river is where this is coming from. And the whole idea of the humbling river is this guy can conquer everything, conquer, climb the mountain, win the war, do all these things, but there's one river he can't cross. And over and over he tries, and he's humbled because he cannot cross the river. And as I'm listening to it, feeling shattered and powerless, and that I've done everything I can, and I don't see a path forward, there twists the line at the end and says, the hands of the many will join as one, and together we'll cross the river. So I didn't know what to do, what to call it. But I'm like, all right, I'm not done. We've been doing this as solo artists. Let's see what we can do as a, as a team. So I'm not doing good on time management. I told you I had a lot of feels. But that different approach where we weren't looking for permission from rock stars, where we weren't strict looking to point fingers or have combat, where we weren't demanding something, but we were offering something had transformative results. And I'm not going to show everybody's face or everybody's name, but I asked Nick initially, Nick Rococo, you know, if he'd try this crazy experiment with me. Uh, law professor Andy Matuition had been coming to La Las Vegas a lot during the rise of Anonymous and DEF CON. She helped nudged me during ThoughtCon the prior year. Space Rogue, whose cold, dead heart had closed off, started like saying his heart grew three or four sizes that day. So Space Rogue kind of became, yes, that's a huge boot full of beer at ThoughtCon. Uh, no beard. You might not recognize him. Um, but you know, we we're talking about what did and didn't work with Loft. And maybe could we try something like that again? Um, didn't even know Bo Woods. Bo missed my talk. He was giving a talk on how to dodge US tax codes by being a digital vagabond and traveling the world. Didn't even see the call to action um, and has become the first and most dedicated and longest lasting recruit that has helped to change the world. That's cause, by the way. You know, we met people like Craig Smith, who wasn't the Chris and Charlie rock star hacker, but had written more tools and democratized more access and helped start the car hacking village. We traveled the world, got swarmed by camels. Um, we, own, we thought that, that was our last dinner there on the, on the left. Uh, we started entering the halls of think tanks in DC as uh, secret invaders. He became Dr. Horrible to do the biohacking village. 
We eventually ended up, you know, briefing in, inside the White House on more than one occasion because they started to realize they needed help. So people that were afraid of hackers a decade earlier are now completely embracing us. Jen Ellis was starting her own thing. She also didn't see the talk, although she knew I was going to do it. She was over at Black Hat trying to like say that hacking is First Amendment protected speech, and she was deeply concerned that her friends might go to jail. And she decided she had to do something about it. So she started on her own journey to try to reform CFA and DMCA, and very quickly we combined forces. We started investing in junior staffers. This is one of two. This is Nick Lazarson. He's been here. This is one of two congressional staffers that first year with a computer science degree. Tomorrow you're going to see the other of the two, Jessica Wilkerson. But we built trust with junior staffers that most people would have turned their nose up to. That man is now running most of ONCD, the Office of National Cyber Director in the White House. More Jen. <laughs> Some of these became family. Jen was my best man at my wedding last year, August 3rd to Audi. Um, Jack married us, um, not me and Jen. My wife does not like her photo online. Uh, but Jack has been a brother and a, often the one picking me up off the floor when I'm emotionally shattered. I have a lot of feels. Lots of hugs. We're going to make the calendar for charity. Uh, we befriended sitting congressmen. We brought two sitting congressmen to DEF CON 25, uh, bipartisan. Will Hurd of Texas, who's now a presidential candidate, so I've had shots with a presidential candidate. Uh, and uh, Jim Langevin, who ardently fought to advance cybersecurity in the Congress. He was founded the Cyber Caucus in the House. He drove the formation of CISA. I want to remind you. We are 10, CISA is five. CISA was in part fashioned after some of the cavalry mission to do defensive work for critical infrastructure, for cyber physical systems. And he helped birth CISA, Cyberspace Solarium Commission, and fought to the end of his administration. Uh, he just retired, but to the end to advance hacker rights, coordinated disclosure, and has been an incredible teammate. We befriended hackers who grew up going to DEF CON and became physicians. And we started CyberMedSummit.org, a, a nonprofit to do ER hacking simulations and crisis simulations with doctors. We worked with patients like Marie Mo, who is both a cryptology PhD hacker and a heart patient, who engendered empathy and gravity when we tried to reform public policy. We befriended nurses like Melena, Internet of Dongs. Uh, international hacker celebrities like Karen, who will be here. Billy Rios, who hated this idea at first um, and was the one doing the prolific research and angry with the, with the FDA, learned that coming to the table and finding common cause and common purpose took his previously ignored research and caused the first recall in history of a medical device for cyber reasons, an unmitigated pathway to harm, the prior standard of care was somebody had to die first, there'd be proof of harm, and enough proof of harm to merit a corrective regulatory action. But we convinced them that in cybersecurity, an unmitigated pathway to harm was enough, and nobody had to die first. <sighs> Mike. Mike left his own company to go to GE to make medical devices safer because he heard the call and he led and he built teams and he mentored people and he trained stuff and he led by example. And when he thought he'd done as much as he could and went to look out, he heard a talk after our congressional task force and he's like, no one's going to fix this, I got to fix it. And he started scope security, left his career again to put his neck out and advance medical. and was also, like Jack, one of the people that picked me up whenever I was defeated. <sighs> Dan was there before there was a cavalry. Dan stepped up behind the scenes and in front of the scenes whenever we needed him to. And he reminded the old school hackers that were sabotaging us and backstabbing us and gatekeeping us. He, it's not about us. It's about them. It's about the people. It's a true hero. And a huge loss. Damon has not perished. 
Damon has been uh, a supporter. I feel happy. Uh, I'm just going to rifle through a lot of this. We had quasi-govies like uh, Art Mannion. We have our honor roll of government hackers who helped us save the world, like Alan Friedman, who's here. Not only did Alan help on SBOM uh, and IoT labels, but also on coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And had we not suffered the slings, arrows, and attacks from some of your historically favorite rock stars, we would not have had carve outs in DMCA and CFAA. We had to normalize and demonstrate value for coordinated vulnerability disclosure. So Alan continues to take up the unpopular, sexy, controversial topics and make them boring for gubbies. Leonard Bailey from DOJ specifically wrote the prosecutorial guidance that if you feel like prosecuting a researcher acting in good faith, don't. <laughs> Suzanne Schwartz, who will be here tomorrow, has been an incredible hacker. She even made her hair purple at one point. Um, she has demonstrated bravery, head and shoulders among any others. And every time she had a victory with us, we were able to use that to cause pressure on other regulators, other executive, to do what she was doing. So she set the pace as a sprinting partner for this. and. Uh, our greatest achievements besides decriminalizing research have been in medical and specifically because of her and her teamwork and partnership on changing the world. We'd had some media partners. I only grabbed one, but Lori Siegel put us in Time Magazine, did two CNN documentaries on hero hackers and on the rise and fall of cyber terrorism, and just took the time to lean in and make sure that the stories were told well. Uh, Sunil Yu and I, uh, he's going to be your keynote tomorrow. Sunil is one of the smartest men alive. Um, Bryson always reminds me right in front of me that Sunil is the smartest cybersecurity person he knows. Um, we got invited this year to the UN General Assembly in January. And it was the most surreal thing I can explain. I had world leaders introducing introductions of introductions of introductions, and every one of them with some accent to some degree said something like, our dependence on connected something something is growing faster than something something in areas affecting public safety and national security something something. And I had this oscillation of incredible pride and validation and incredible crush defeat that it's, we wasted a decade. And then said, but at least they're getting it now. But then realized, oh no, they're gonna go for information sharing first. And then I, and then I just kind of threw my script away and Sunil and I just spoke from the heart and hopefully we've saved them another decade of wasted time. But like we have, this community is finally a decade later in the international security mindset. And of course our celebrity member of Dwayne The Rock Johnson, that's a joke. Um, <laughs> He did say that, and he spelled it correctly. So my biggest regret about the cavalry is the name. No, um, no but seriously, um, not only is it always spelled cavalry, because it's a real word where they killed Jesus of Nazareth, completely different tone than cavalry. Um, but also, you know, we've lost something in the last 10 years. Um, the cav I am the cavalry was not Josh, it was not Bo, it was not Jen, it was not the thousands of volunteers, it wasn't the early adopters like Adam Rand. It was meant to be something you said. Like this was your personal commitment. This is not a spectator sport. And while we do love the praise or the, or the thank yous we get sometimes, what we really want is your participation. Because some of the biggest contributors were not elite hacksaws, they were nurses. They were policy lawyers. They were junior staffers. And uh, in the last 10 years, I fear we may have become a crutch. So as I asked myself at the 10 year mark, what do we do with the cavalry? Is it mission accomplished? Did we succeed? Can we end it? Do we transform it to solve the new missing pieces and take on a new mission or two? Or do we combine it with other initiatives to get to critical mass? In the last decade, we've not taken a penny of funding. It was a choice often debated but I wanted to be free of any sort of appearance of conflict or any way for someone to ad hominem dismiss our efforts. How am I doing on time? Terribly, right?
I don't know what that means. Five minutes? Oh my god. Okay, so we're not gonna do what I intended to do. Okay. Um, so, so verbally, here's some accomplishments, okay? And this is not a Josh thing. We did this. We crossed the river, okay? We said we focus on wherever bits and bites meet flesh and blood. And that meant any cyber physical systems. We started with cars. We published a five-star automotive cyber safety framework on our first birthday. It said anything, all systems fail. You should avoid failure by take, uh, having safety by design to avoid failure, coordinated disclosure to take help avoiding failure, capture, study, and learn from failure, prompt an agile response to failure, and contain and isolate failure. A year later, we did a Hippocratic Oath for Connected Medical Devices to work with Suzanne. In that same year, we got the first ever recall and nobody died. Because of the trust we built, we put pressure through Congress on NHTSA, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, to try to regulate cars similarly. She changed the pre-market guidance to bring medical devices to start requiring cybersecurity things. She later changed the post-market to encourage coordinated vulnerability disclosure gave them an incentive that if you have a coordinated disclosure program and you can mitigate your issue in 30 to 60 days, then we won't give you a recall. There's a little more to it than that. That work engendered enough trust that when the nation asked for a congressional task force on healthcare, I was the one and only hacker at named to that 21 person task force. We told Congress, this is not about your HIPAA privacy. I love my privacy. I'd like to be alive to enjoy it. And we essentially pivoted them from a data privacy regime to a patient safety regime. We started that task force with a, uh, the first dramatic uh, attack on US hospitals. It was Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital in early 2016. Shut down patient care for a week. They had to cancel surgeries, divert ambulances to nearby facilities in LA traffic. It was harrowing. People may have died, but they didn't measure it right. And we ended the task force with WannaCry, shutting down 40% of UK hospital healthcare delivery. So we were trying to add gravity uh, to encourage more tight collaboration with us. And we're gonna skip a bunch of stuff in the middle, but the Mirai botnet happened, and it showed that even cheap consumer IoT stuff could shut down the internet for a day. So it was unpatch you know, internet connected, unpatchable, with default passwords. And Senator Warner spent hours with Bo and I and crafted this, the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act of 2017, which failed, thanks to lots of lobbying, but in the following Congress, during the pandemic, it was reintroduced in a watered down way. And in December 2020, while I was at my low running the CISA COVID task force, it passed into fucking law. Hackers passed a fucking law. Also, when the globe hit a pandemic, some of you don't even know I did this. And I have scars the rest of my life from doing it. But Director Krebs of the newly minted CISA, fashion in part in our image, when the pandemic was declared, he asked, he called and said, do you want to serve your country for a year? Um, I don't know what you do when you get a call like that. But I became the chief strategist for the CISA COVID task force. And our job was to protect the 7,000 hospitals in the country during record high ransom activity from a larger volume and variety and record low supply chain resilience. And then we asked, got asked to protect the vaccine supply chains. So I did that for 18 months to the day and a bunch for free on both ends and I'm kind of traumatized. But I'm gonna give you a hurricane tour of a couple things. Those are the good news, okay? Don't make me forget the Patch Act before he gives me the hook, okay? Here we go. So the idea of the cavalry is no one's coming to save us. What are you willing and able to do? Generally speaking, whenever I testify, I say something like, we are over-dependent on undependable things in areas that can cause loss of life. Over-dependent on undependable things. Some context, um, many of the cyber-physical systems that are exposed are what I called at CISA, and now it's one of the best things we've ever done, by the way, is hack the lexicon. The number of things coming out of public policy officials that we uttered, uh, you hack the lexicon, you hack the world. You gotta change their mindset and reframe things. So one of them was called Target Rich Cyber Poor, building on Wendy Nather's classic living below the security poverty line. This was a phrase they could, they could stomach. And the idea is forever bad guys targeted the Fortune 100 and Fortune 500. Why? That's where the money is. And forever, the RSA conference floor and the Black Hat conference floor 
would target the same people because that's where the money is. Ransomware changed everything because the unavailability of anyone can be monetized. So adversaries figured out how to monetize the cyber poor. Defenders still have not. And the result of that is we are seeing disruptions on a regular basis at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, food, water, shelter, safety. So when we started the cavalry, I was worried that things were flammable and I wanted people to see that hacking is not just fucking credit cards. It's not just fucking privacy. It is public safety, human life. And during my time at CISA, we had successful hacks of the water you drink, of the food you put on your table, of the oil and gas pipelines that fuel your economies and your supply chains, of the schools kids attend to, of the municipalities who run towns and cities, of federal agencies charged with national security, and of timely access to patient care during a pandemic with now proven mortal consequences. My team published proof that ransom attacks strain hospitals sufficient to lead to loss of life. The federal government is broken. This is 16 silos of designated critical infrastructure written by PPD21. Doesn't, don't read them. There's 16 silos. They act like silos. Each one of them has an owner in the federal government, a sector risk management agency. Each one says, stay out of our lane. Why are you in our lane? This is our lane. Even though risk is inherently cross-sector, there's military-grade enforcement, and as a hacker in a federal government during the pandemic, we broke down every wall and barrier we could, and I got the scars to prove it. But it's not built for collaboration. Each one has a public-private partnership, which usually means a really dominant private sector tells, a, tells the, the government, don't regulate us, and a really weak sector risk management agency says, okay, but that's changing. Then came CISA. CISA was like, hey, you guys should not compete with each other to hire and train and retain cybersecurity talent and physical security talent. So they became a shared workforce. They also said, hey, you can't manage risk at the sector level. You need to do these 55 national critical functions. I'm not going to explain what they are. One of them is provide medical care. Can you get timely access to care when you need it, where you need it? Well, in the before times, we learned from our empathy that a 4.4 minute longer ambulance ride during a marathon had a statistically significant mortality rate. So 4.4 minute delay is enough to lead to loss of life for heart. We know from strokes that there's a golden hour or golden hours that one, three or four hours, time is brain, is the difference if you can walk again or talk again, if you breathe. In our Congressional Task Force report, we said healthcare is in critical condition, published Mother's Day weekend in 2017. The hospital says we can't afford to protect it. We don't have any money. If you gave us another $5 million, we'd hire more nurses. And we said, you both can't afford to protect it and can't afford not to, but they didn't get it. So we said, until pe they said, until people started dying, we're not going to listen. So we did what good hackers do. And Christian uh, DeMeff, Jeff Tully, Bo and I started CyberMed Summit. We started killing people in ER hacking simulations, not for real. <sighs> And we knew that stuff, but during the pandemic, everything changed, okay? So I did not make this graphic, my friend Ben did, but when we went into the belly of the beast for, and Bo came as well, and a couple other hackers, we had to secure the vaccine supply chains, protect hospitals. I'm gonna skip the ball bearings stuff. Protect hospitals. Um, generally speaking, hospitals and stakeholders wanna keep people alive. How do you do that? You need carrying capacity. How do you get carrying capacity? It's three S's. This is how they see their world. We have to meet them where they are. Space, supplies, and staff, such that if you have a 100-bed hospital, you don't have 100 beds of capacity. That's your space. If you can only staff 80 of those 100 beds. And if you only have supplies for 60 of those 80, you have a 60-bed capacity. So it is the coefficient of the three S's. And that's all they want to spend money on, especially under financial constraint. But I tried to enhance that and enrich that because as we tried to keep people alive during the pandemic, at the one-year mark of the pandemic, 150,000 people died from excess deaths from non COVID conditions, and my instinct was, I'll bet you these are time sensitive, like heart, brain, and pulmonary. And unlike the 500,000 COVID deaths, these were young people. The fastest growing demographic was 25 to 44 year olds, young people who would have lived but for timely access to patient care disruptions. So I enhanced their model and I said, it's not just keeping people alive. What are the latency sensitive? Think like hackers. What are the latency sensitive things where minutes or hours are difference between life and death? And also, they didn't realize this, but the medical technology 
is a force multiplier of staff. A neonatal intensive care unit nurse in 1990 could handle a single digit number of babies concurrently safely. But armed with a bevy of modern technology, they can handle 15 kids at a time through remote monitoring stations. So if the technology is a force multiplier of the staff, then the unavailability of that is a force divider. And what they couldn't understand is that unavailability dramatically affected patient care for the most time sensitive and urgent care, which is exactly what happened in the first proof of loss of life on October 1st. This is not the baby, but October 1st of 2021, front page of the Wall Street Journal revealed a court case that's ongoing where a baby lost their life in Alabama when the hospital was ransomed and the unavailability of technology compromised the quality of care and the nurse to patient ratio is sufficient, the baby subsequently perished. In this neonatal intensive care unit, there are more than a dozen connected technologies that are vital to the delivery of safe care for those patient to, to caregiver ratios. And when they go away, it affects the patient. On the very same day with a named victim of a cyber incident, we, we published the first statistical proof of loss of life using data science. And I'm not gonna do the data science now, but basically we saw a strong positive correlation between excess deaths and ICU bed strain. So when hospitals got over 75% nationally of their ICU strain, you saw 18,000 dead Americans two weeks. If it got to 100%, you saw 80,000 dead Americans. So when we say we care about saving lives, this is where the rubber meets the road, folks. And unless and until policymakers could understand that a cyber disruption can strain a hospital sufficient to lead to loss of life. So we took this measurement that has nothing to do with cyber and we applied it to a state hit hardest by ransomware. And in the same state with the same population adjusting for uh, hospital type and size, we could see that the affected regions achieved these excess death stress levels sooner and stayed there longer than their peers and could quantify minimum, maximum, and most likely loss of life corroborated by state level data. So now we have the first name victim and the first statistical proof of life and we can go to Congress and tell them, you gotta do something about this and they have. So this is a hot mess, don't try to study it, but basically what we realized is to provide medical care, it's not just HHS and there's just their public private partnership. It, they depend on other critical functions from other sectors. And if you take away water, you don't have a hospital anymore. You take away power, you don't have a hospital anymore. You take away supplies and transportation. So back to Maslow's hierarchy, what we realize is the way the government and not just ours, the UK and Australia, they're all listening to this new framing, is that when everything's critical, nothing's critical. So we have to stratify. So one way I did it is latency sensitivity if you shut this critical function off for 24 to 48 hours, does anybody die? And what you end up with is less than 10 of the 55 are latency sensitive enough to lead to mass casualties. So these are some of them poorly plotted, but provide medical care is probably the most important of all. And they depend upon each other. So any disruption in independency could affect your ability to provide medical care in a region. And as people suffer excess deaths, it's cutting into the workforce that allows those things to stay resilient. So it's a positive feedback loop with negative consequences. And because of these uncomfortable truths, PPD 21 or Presidential Policy Directed 21, which is the Obama era definition of the 16 critical infrastructure sectors and the shared responsibility models is not getting a refresh. It is getting a rewrite informed from hackers and systems thinkers. And hopefully, we'll start to look at cross-sector risk. But the overwhelming majority of those things I just pointed out are target-rich and cyber-poor. They don't have CISOs. They don't have security budgets. They don't participate in public-private partnerships. They don't have someone to send to an ISAC or the money to pay for one. And Emma's going to talk about some of these target-rich, cyber-poor in the talk and the, to start the cavalry track. But with each wave of the pandemic, we were further cutting into the workforce. So. Hacker's gonna hack. I'm skipping a bunch of other stuff here, but some of the leave behind so that we can live off the land later uh, is, I said, screw uttering best practices and just do zero trust and just do NIST. We need to talk about the bad practices. So we named three bad practices. Uh, things like the use of unsupported and end of life operating systems in service of critical infrastructure and national critical functions is dangerous and materially elevates risks to public safety, economic, national security, and human life. This dangerous practice is especially egregious on internet connected technologies. 
in other words, if you're using an end of life operating system on Shodan, it could lead to end of life of humans. So we wanted these things to be negligent. Number two, I couldn't say shit and I couldn't say Shodan. So instead of saying get your shit off Shodan, we published get your stuff off search. So if you have zero security play, at least get your shit off Shodan. See what your adversaries can see because often that's enough to disrupt things. The most important vulnerable weak link in the vaccine supply chains for four of the candidates was a single sole source manufacturer on the planet. They had one plant, three IT people, zero security people, and they were all over Shodan. You could have sneezed on them and killed another couple million people. So we might feel good about our public-private partnerships. We have neglected the target rich but cyber poor in ways that could affect your life. To their credit, CISA finally accelerated and started publishing the KEV list, the known exploited vulnerabilities list that takes the, out of all the CVEs ever written, 3% ever get exploited and they winnow it down to the ones that are known to have caused harm in critical infrastructure. You should be living by this, not CBSS stuff. They also made the CPGs, the Cyber Performance Goals. The White House really liked my bad practices and really liked my crawl, walk, run, kind of get your stuff off search and said, what do you do after that? So this is 30 of the 400, 30, controls of the 36 controls of the 400 page NIST cybersecurity framework because 10 years after the voluntary NIST cybersecurity framework what's been clear is most owners and operators of critical infrastructure have volunteered to ignore it so if you can't do all of it do the crawl stage of crawl walk run I've been pushing transparency and SBOM saying SBOM's coming it's here the patch act is an acronym but in early 2022, Congress, in a bipartisan way, introduced a law saying we need mandatory minimum cybersecurity requirements for all FDA approved medical devices. The lobbyists lost their freaking minds. But part of why they did it is we are starting to see losses of life. And we need to preserve the trust and safety of the public. So it was introduced in a bipartisan way and passed almost unanimously in the House. It was almost dead on arrival in the Senate because of millions of dollars spent to kill it. In May of last that year, I testified to the Senate. Um, I considered playing that five minute for you, but the job was to convince one particular holdout senator if he should fight for this or not. And even though all the Patch Act was stripped out of all the legislative vehicles and it should have been dead, in December, while I'm on my belated honeymoon with Audie, uh, he fought his ass off and he got it stuck in the appropriations omnibus bill. And the Patch Act is law of the land. Hackers passed a second fucking law. This was a team effort to be sure. Kevin Fu's original work, the FDA's courage, Hill staffers, Bo, lots of people raised this village, raised this child. That said, you cannot bring a medical device to market anymore if it is not patchable, if it does not have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program to work with good faith hackers, and if it does not have a software bill of materials and threat models and a bunch of other stuff. So it won't fix the legacy problem we have today, but going forward, large, small, medium, rural hospitals will all have more safe and defensible things. Hackers helped write most chunks of the White House national cybersecurity strategy. Senator Warner is doing it again. He wrote a paper that said cybersecurity is patient safety, and he's intending to introduce regulation on the hospitals who are too fragile uh, to care. So what we have to do, what the hackers have to do, is ask how do you take the fact that for the next 15 years, no matter how much help and regulation we push, hospitals are going to be routinely ransomed. They're going to successfully be ransomed for the next 15 years. So one of my analogies is after 9-11, we had we recognize you can have hijackers get on a plane and turn the plane into a missile. And we did a lot of stupid shit as a country and as an international community in response to that. But one of the smart things we did is we added steel reinforced cockpit doors. So they'll get on the plane, they won't get in the cockpit is the idea. So I've been asking, what are the steel reinforced cockpit doors of hospitals? What, if, what things, if you shut them off, could lead to loss of life? It's electronic medical record systems, it's heart, brain, and pulmonary. We also have to ask, what's the regional impact of the 7,000 hospitals in this country? If a hospital goes down here in 
Vegas, there's another one within driving distance, maybe, to not have loss of life. But if a hospital goes down in the middle of rural America, you're probably gonna see elevated loss of life. So which systems are too isolated to fail? Unfortunately, they're failing in droves. So I've been asking, how can the hackers help here? Not to hack things in hospitals, but the things that are truly connected to loss of life or national security resilience. Same thing for the food supply. Hackers are turning to the food supply. While you've probably seen a dozen hacks like JBS or Pilgrim's Pride or Dole or Americold, uh, the newly forming ISAC for food, because we've never had an ISAC for food until now, because we didn't care about food, um, they've tracked over 100 successful electronic compromises in their database. So we wanna see what's the food supply, because like the healthcare supply, the food supply depends on chemicals, on water and wastewater, on cold chain, on electricity. And you're gonna hear about Hungry Hungry Hackers from Sick Codes and uh, Casey John Ellis, and you're gonna hear about it from Paul Roberts. You're gonna hear water, water everywhere after that. So I'm very concerned about these water, food, electricity, and emergency care that are target rich, but cyber poor and geographically isolated, that if disrupted could lead to loss of life or loss of food supply. So the idea here is uh, maybe one of the futures for the cavalry is focusing on these target rich, cyber poor, basic human needs like food and water and shelter and safety. Okay. I'm basically getting the hook. I'm gonna stop that line of thought and tie this up. I'd like to tell you, I'd like to tell you a tale of victory. I can't. Because while I thought the cavalry could end and we could say we did a good job, I thought I could tell you that. I thought I could say, well, maybe the cavalry should transform. Uh, maybe we should just focus on food and, and water and electricity, and that's what the track today is about. And then I said, well, but if I spent the next 10 years on hospitals alone, I'm still not sure we could succeed, because it's one thing to get the medical devices safe, but this map, guys, this map, are hospital closures. There's 7,000 hospitals in the country, 85% of them are medium, small, and rural. 15% are large. The 15% have a CISO. They go to ISACs. The 85% don't. In this time-lapse photography, these are hospitals that have closed forever. If there isn't a nearby hospital, the people that live in those zip codes are gonna have a higher death rate for heart, brain, and pulmonary. They are closing and no one's replacing them. Now they were closing before the pandemic, they're further strained during the pandemic, and many of these small rural hospitals have four weeks or less of cash flow on hand. Four weeks or less. So where does cybersecurity come in? In preparation for this keynote about, about two months ago, St. Margaret's in Illinois closed forever. It's just one hospital, it's not the first closure. People are like, ah, hospitals close. We'll, we'll buy them, we'll put them in, but a lot of these aren't getting bought. They're just going away. Some of the ones that get bought because they're distressed, they get put on life support, stripped for parts, they take the doctors, they take the equipment, they shut down services. So they're basically in a coma. So you're seeing hundreds of these 7,000 hospitals where people live going away. And if it's more than three hours away, you're gonna see a lot of dead people from strokes and heart. And we're not replacing them. So here's why St. Margaret's gutted me. It's the first hospital to cite as part of their cause of death, their ransom distress. Because if most of these hospitals have four weeks cash flow on hand and a typical ransom will shut you down for six to eight weeks, six to 12 weeks, it's a death sentence. So while it is not the, the thing that made them financially distressed, privatized medicine did, pandemic did, it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And we're having 700 plus ransoms a year. So how many more rural hospitals where you or your families live are you willing to see go away forever? So I can't fix the healthcare system outside of cyber. I'm not even sure I can fix or we can fix the healthcare system inside of cyber. But what I know is they can't afford to invest in minimum cyber hygiene. They can't. And they can't afford not to. And I don't know what to do about that. And if we spent our next 10 years on this, I'm not sure we would fix it. So I am humbled again while we have crossed the river and we have 
done exactly what I set out to do. I didn't want to fix a single medical device from a single manufacturer. I wanted to hack the system and the rules for all medical devices. We did that. And on the other side of that river, I can now see more and more turbulent rivers ahead. So we are not public health officials, but we have failed to integrate into their hazards model that if you don't spend enough on cyber resilience, you might go out of business. So we have to have empathy for their situation, but also advocacy that if we don't do anything, we could see another several hundred closures or predatory acquisitions, and you may not get timely access to care. It's one thing if it's a consult and you have to drive overnight to get to it. It's another when you're in desperate need of time-sensitive care. So I'm basically out of time, but when I look at this and I zoom out, it's, by the way, straws are back to camel's back. Um, when I zoom out, I've been asking since January, do we end the cavalry? Do we transform it into something else? Like the bottom of Maslow's, like a pure healthcare? Or how do you get scale? Because what we're doing at current course and speed, it's not enough. And we've asked a lot of you, if you look at Bo or Jen, we're exhausted. So if there's new recruits, if there's new leaders, then maybe we kill the cavalry and we start the cavalry academy. What if we make a boot camp and a recipe book for if you want to save the world, if you want to make the world a safer place, we will mentor you, accelerate you, boot camp you. So an incubator accelerator for people that want to change the world. This only works if someone in this audience wants to pick up a project and have the audacity to try to pass laws or change incentives or connect the dots that make sure those hospitals are not just evaporating on our watch. We did not cause these problems, but we have a unique ability to solve them. So I'm still trying to answer that question. Friday was my last day in the private sector. I'm uncertain what the path forward is, but I'm committing myself to spend the next up to three months seeing who reveals themselves. I didn't even know who Bo Woods was when I made the last call to action, and he helped me change the world. Some of you in this room can help for the next decade. So I don't know if there's any of you or which of you, but if you'd like to do something bigger than yourself, as the world increasingly depends on connected technology, they increasingly depend on you. So who wants to change the world? Find me. And we do have a mic and a little time for questions. Please be very careful. Anybody going by the projector here, it's uh, got a broken leg and it will topple right over and break. Hey, you have to put up your information. Uh, so people can't contact you. I should have. Um, uh, the best place to find me for the next two days is in the Copa Lounge for them, the Cavalry Track. And several of the things we touched upon will be explored in greater detail. You can find me online most places at Josh Corman, J O S H C O R M A N. I am the Cavalry on Twitter. Or I am the Cavalry on Twitter. <laughs>